Ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, colleagues, about six months ago when I was asked to present the subject nutrient use efficiency, my question to myself was, why me? <laughs> I'm not a soil scientist, neither a soil physicist. Um, I do not have many products or many pro a lot of product knowledge in the primary fertilizer industry. Being the odd one out, I started to consult a friend. The friend's name is Google. And Google confused me more. <laughs> because 99% of the subject matter on nutrient use efficiency is called nitrogen use efficiency. Coming out of the secondary nutrient industry, um, the growth stimulants, what's currently referred to as mainly the group three elements, I started to look a little bit further. And I saw that the, the products that fall within that industry actually fits in to the subject matter of nutrient use efficiency. For that purpose, the theme, back to basics for the future, in my essence, should be back to the future with basics. If you look at the, uh, show some of our ages, the 1985 film with Michael J. Fox of the car that went back into the future on what did it work? Rubbish. It was driven by awful material that came out of a dustbin. Now that's how some perceive typically these group three products. The future lies within the basic old chemistries, and that old chemistries is typically your seaweeds, your composted materials, your microbes, and hopefully I can show you a little bit about those components enhanced through modern technology. On nutrient use efficiency, that's the main subject. Let me start off with some facts, some world problems, some of it is known. The world population is currently over 7 billion. By 2050, it should be, according to the FAO statistics, over 9 billion mouths that needs food. We currently sit with 1.5 billion hectares land under permanent crops. The question is, is it enough? Out of the nutrient use efficiency question, what is the impact of feeding that quantity of people needing more land on our environment? 90% of all these soils that is used in agriculture is deficient of essential nutrients. Most of it due to anything from mining activities, human impact contain toxic elements. Four billion hectares of ice-free land have soil acidity problems. 950 million hectares of that land is salt affected. So it creates a huge problem, again, to feed Number one, primary fertilizer use, as you can see, is not sustainable. There's a huge quantity of nitrogen, phosphates, and potassium used. And it is, non, most, in most cases, non-renewable resources. The recovery that we see at number six, according to statistics, shows us, again, that the use 
of primary fertilizers could not be environmentally friendly. So what is agriculture facing? The bleak picture will get a little bit better later. The biggest challenges that, that, that we currently face in agriculture is to improve crop production, to feed an expanding world population. What is the pressure on agriculture? Typically limited geographic regions suitable for agriculture, climate change that impact growing conditions, the adverse effects as a result of agriculture itself is damage to the environment. Agricultural practices has a very large carbon footprint and it requires, as I said, uh, the use of non-renewable resources. How do, we, how do we solve these challenges and pressure um, and the effects of agricultural practices? One option, and we know it's an impossible task, is increasing land area for agriculture. It's rather getting less. Increased production while maintaining current rates of inputs, also very, very difficult. Increase yields, decrease inputs, decrease resistance to stress, very difficult. Reduce environmental damage from agricultural inputs, not likely. That section there at the bottom, improve crop nutrient use efficiency is imperative for the future of agriculture and the inputs into agriculture. My presentation is mainly going to focus on a small component of nutrient use efficiency called nutrient capture efficiency. Nutrient capture efficiency is equivalent to the dry matter produced per unit of nutrient applied and it is mainly a root trait. An increase in root volume is an indication of nutrient capture efficiency and how are the, the higher your root volume is, the higher your nutrient capture efficiency would be. Nutrient capture efficiency is affected by First of all, the availability of your nutrients, the root architecture, the function of your roots, and the symbiotic associations within the roots. So nutrient capture efficiency, just going to call it nutrient use efficiency throughout the, the presentation, is a measure of how well plants use the nutrients that is available to those plants. In that, there is aspects that's controllable and there's aspects that's uncontrollable. The uncontrollable ones is typically light temperature, moisture, the soil structure. Again, as I said, I'm not a soil scientist, so I'm just mentioning it. The, the cultivar, the traits of the, of, of, of the crop. And then what can we control? The fertilizer, the type of fertilizer, the application methods, the lime, the pesticides, the irrigation, the, the, the tillage, the practices, the culture, culture meaning how, we're, how a farmer farms, and genetics. So that's the con controllable aspects. From my side, as a biochemist, I'm looking at, at different aspects from primary fertilizer and lime and soil practices, a lot of my type of technology that, 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 that my company employ is on foliage. So we don't do a lot of the, 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 the soil analyses, although it does have an uh, impact. So we, we must look at the design of the next generation of sustainable products or products for sustainable agriculture. And part of that includes the modification of the physical properties of those products, the diffusion and the mass flow. Look, there's a lot of talk these days about nanoscale nutrients, nanoscale technology, but what is nanoscale really about? Changes in the nutrient acquisition 
how a plant acquires its new nutrients and root morphology. We can look at organic nutrients like the humates, typically composted components, fulvates, protein hydrolysates. The organic non-microbial biostimulants is also an area. The oldest fertilizer in the world, the seaweed extracts and <coughs> other plant growth enhancers. And then also your plant growth promoting microorganisms. That's going to be part of the subject matter of tomorrow, not mine luckily. So I'm just going to look at four of these components quickly. One is nanoscale nutrients. When my company took a typical non-available nutrient, secondary nutrient, zinc source, zinc carbonate, and we look at the bioavailability of zinc carbonate through foliage of a plant, it is almost zero. With the technology, technology sorry, that is currently available, it is possible to mill zinc carbonate that is a totally inorganic mineral to a nanoscale. Normal size of a zinc carbonate powder is between 40 to 80 microns. And when it is milled down to nanoscale, it reaches a level of between 400 to 800 nanometers with a D90 value in the region of about 600 nanometers. And with that, the properties of that zinc carbonate drastically changes. This is a, a, a photo of the capabilities of a nanoscale powder compared to its micronized counterpart when just placed in water. Remember, it is not soluble, so it can't dissolve. And over time, what happens with the, 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 um, the zinc carbonate, you will notice after 20 minutes, typically the zinc carbonate settles to the bottom, and due to the electrostatic forces that exist in the much smaller nanoscale particles, you get a much longer suspension. Now the question uh, would be asked, what does this have to do with nutrient use efficiency? At this stage of the, the presentation, nothing. <laughs> it is, at this stage, just showing you electrostatic forces that, that, that is created that keep the particles in suspension that makes it easier for application. And the reason why I'm saying that is already gives you the advantage that you will not sit with blockages in nozzles when it's applied as a, as a liquid. And that has a, a, a advantage towards the farmer. Trials, when you use that zinc particle on maize, at, we've done the trials at a 360 gram zinc value per thousand square meter at the spot trials. It's just calculated on, on that basis. The D90 value, meaning the, that 90% of the particle size of that zinc is less than 780 nanometers. When we compare it as a foliar applied application and samples is drawn on an hourly basis compared to standard water soluble zinc sulfates and nitrates, over the five hour period, an 18% higher zinc value is obtained within the plant material upon leaf analysis. Again, zinc nitrate, 34%. So that just shows an example of how technology 
can advance nutrient use efficiency by just scaling down on particle size. Same was done. This is on, on, on wheat. Slightly different scenario, but same type of result. Over a six hour period, 18 and 12 percent higher zinc values obtained within the, the plant material. And she said, this is an example of nutrient efficiency when a totally insoluble material is used and just converted or particle size converted to a lower nanometer scale. A very controversial product, humic substances or the humates and fulvates. Humic substances is natural organic molecules. It um, is converted biologically and chemically from organic matter for those that don't know humates. I don't know people that do not know humates anymore. Humic substances have been perceived for a long uh, time as the, as, the, as the primordial components of soil fertility and structure. That is part of the back to basics section where humates is even older substances that is used uh, in its composted form as a soil nutrient. What does humates do? They improve soil structure, increase cation exchange, um, improve solubility of molecules like phosphorus and calcium. It also has a typical in inverted brackets, hormonal action, where it improves um, roots, root hair growth, and it also stimulates the assimilation of certain nutrients like your nitrates. Just showing you a, 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 a net house trial that we did with, with uh, a humate. 34 days after application, this is the untreated control. On your right hand side, you can already see there's something to expect, there's some, some changes. After 77 days, after application of the, the potassium humate in the trial, we already saw differences in foliar analysis where the potassium humate was applied compared to an untreated control. Now, untreated control doesn't mean it was not fertilized. It just means it didn't get potassium humate. And again, back to the subject matter, nutrient use efficiency, there is all those values that is in green, nitrogen, phosphates, um, potassium, etc. Those values on an average scale was increased. Chlorophyll content also measured 77 days after, after application where the minimum uh, or the maximum quant concentration of potassium humate was applied a 237% increase in chlorophyll units, spud units, was measured. Something definitely happens when a potassium humate is applied. Now, I'm not saying that there is all humates are the same. I'm not saying all humates contain the same components, and I'm not saying all humates will give the same result. I'm just showing you what to expect when a humate is used. This potassium humate that we've, we've used in this trial, we don't know what is the humic acid value in it. There's only a few things that we, we, we know for certain, and that is that it is 95%, 90 to 95%, let me follow the forces, Variances, 19 to 95% water soluble. We know there's a water soluble component. And roughly 5% uh, 
water insoluble components. Now, water insoluble components, if you go and look at literature, it could be human, which is the insoluble component of, 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 of the humic substances. It can also be inorganic minerals. During the, the trial, as I said, this is a net house trial, it's under controlled conditions, 56 days after application, where no humate was applied. It, it's an it's a, it's a in furrow application, equivalent to 5 kgs per hectare, 10 kgs per hectare. That is the variances that we saw. Something must happen. We didn't apply anything else to that, to that trial. That is purely as a result of the organic matter that was applied. After 85 days, measurements was done of the trial. We saw 128% against at, at the maximum level, 128% increase in root weight. That's on a, on a weight basis. On a dry basis, 130. Uh, 603% increase on root weight. The moisture content increased um, by 130 grams. So the moisture absorption efficiency increased. This is the above ground analysis. The plant parts above ground level gave 81% on weight basis weight increase compared to the untreated control and in the photos you can see it. When applying an organic substance like a humic acid in a fertilized field, I'm not saying on maize but on any crop, we've seen similar activities and increases in the nutrient use. On the last of the four sub areas that, that I said I will focus on, responses via the use of plant biostimulants. Now just a definition, biostimulants is material of little or no fertilizer value. It's not fertilizers, but it is used to increase plant growth at very low concentrations. Plant biostimulants or growth enhancers, there's many words for it, are defined through their claimed agronomic, agronomic effects such as improvement of nutrient use efficiency, tolerance to about abiotic stressors and crop quality. There's currently a draft out from the EU that say Organic non-microbial plant biostimulants include natural substances like the humic acids that we saw now, the protein hydrolysates, the seaweed extracts, and in, again, that friend Google of mine says, seaweed extracts constitute 37% of the total market currently for those substances. The next section, I will show a little bit of the work that, again, that we've done with these, these compounds and the typical results that we saw. This is now in a pot trial, not in a, in a, in a, in a, in a um, net house. In the pot trials on wheat, 28 days after application, and we worked on both Eclonia maxima and Ascofilum nodosum, the one cell burst or cell mold technology and the other one probably done the same but afterwards alkaline extracted. In the pot trial we measured certain parameters and out of those parameters we saw that stem, when applying the seaweed, whether it's the one or the other, roughly 40% increase in stem width was attained on the wheat. Plant length increased by about 48%. The root length between 40 to 70%. The dry mass between 36 to 52% of the roots, dry mass of the, of the above ground, 
120 to 137%, and an increase of chlorophyll of between 11 to 23%. Whether it's the one seaweed or the other seaweed, we saw some form of positive effect. When the values are combined, we see an, an average increase in growth of between 42 and 53 percent and an 86 percent increase in weight. Same trial now in the field. At this stage, we applied only 50 milliliters per hectare of North Sea kelp ascofilum, but with it a one gram per liter of a synthetic oxen. And in that trial, we materialized or got 21% higher grain yield compared to the control that had just fertilizer applied without the, the, the seaweed and the, the oxen extract. Again, if you look at the, the orange or brown color, you will see the increase in root volume as a result of the application of the seaweed extract and comes back to when you increase root volume, you increase the nutrient capture e efficiency. When the same trial was done on maize, same type of effect, we again just as an average on growth parameters between 38 and 42 percent and an average increase on weight. Remember, this is a pot trial, this is not in field conditions, between 66 and 71 percent weight differences between the untreated and the treated trials. This is graftings that was done last year. As you can see, the, the treatments was done with um, the, the, the products uh, for intervals in 2018, and the trial was terminated um, in November. The untreated control, just normal uh, fertilizer application on the first one, one gram of an oxen solution, 50 moles per hectare again. Second one, one gram per liter oxen, 100 moles, just the 2x dosage. And then a totally different one with only 0 0.1 gram and they were applied at one liter and two liter. The root growth that was established as a result of, of the application of plant growth enhancers is the lowest level, 35% higher root volume up to 153% compared to the control. These growth enhancers definitely have an effect on root growth and if you back to the subject matter if you increase root growth or root volume you will increase nutrient capture efficiency and also nutrient use efficiency the last slide is uh, where we looked at above ground foliage application of tricontinol. Now, for those that don't know tricontinol, tricontinol is a chlorophyll stimulant. It mainly works in your chlorophyll B system. This is just to show the effect of, of a, a totally synthetic substance that controls or enhances the efficacy of your, your photosynthetic system as I say, they giving green fuel to the plant engine. After application of the tricontinol, we increased the chlorophyll content, again measured as spud units, by 37% within 14 days, making the plant greener. When it's greener, it will produce a lot more of its own nutrients, and this is the function of tricontinol. In summary, the subject matter, as I tried to say in the beginning, of nutrient use efficiency is so wide, 
a whole conference can be just based on the subject. This is not even the tip of the iceberg. My plan was not to be the tip of the iceberg, but just to show what could be used to enhance the nutrient use efficiency of your primary nutrients. Conditions in agriculture is never going to improve. We must realize it. There's not going to be better, better conditions. There's not going to be better fertilizers. There's not going to be more land made available. Farmers must do the best with what they have. Soil acidity with the best liming practices worldwide will be there. The use of modern technology is required to increase nutrient use efficiency and also nutrient capture efficiency. Farmers should focus a lot more on conservation farming, that is the buzzword, and it is also true. Protect soils, protect water sources, and also make sure that your beneficial microbes stay alive. Now, I also did not concur with one on the last section. I also have the work according to the nutrient stewardship framework. Apply the right nutrient at the right rate, in the right place, and at the right rate. Thank you.